virtual reality, a way of getting away from reality that doesn't involve drugs. Who doesn't wish that they could wander off into another world for a little while and leave the worries of the real world behind? I know I do. Well, in the early 90s, virtuality machines, made by W Industries, were all about taking players to another world, a place where you don't even need a driving license to fly a plane, shoot down enemy robots, you can even wander around in the body of this cyborg thing. These days VR games can do all sorts, but in the early 90s this stuff was mind-boggling and so many gamers were chasing that fully immersive experience. And uh, they're going to be telling us a little bit about virtual reality, so I've made my own virtual re- no, it's not it's hopeless isn't it? I'm not even going to put it on. If you wanted a true VR experience in the early 90s, you needed to look to virtuality. These things became the darling of the amusements for a hot minute, but what a minute. If you want to learn more about the VR scene before virtuality came along, and how virtuality as a company was born, check out Nostalgia Nerd's recent video on it. He got dibs on the more popular subject because he's got more subscribers. To get up close and personal with the virtuality machines, myself and Nostalgia Nerd drove all the way to Leicester to the Retro Computer Museum. This is the only place in the UK where currently you can play one of these machines to our knowledge. There are four in the tiny museum at the moment, two sit-down models and two stand-up models. All four are owned by retro VR enthusiast and general all-round lovely lad Simon Marston. What we have here are the first generation arcade machines the 1000CS, the stand-up model, and the 1000SD, which is this sit-down unit. Both units are powered by an Amiga 3000. Here's Simon typing in directions for it. The second series, by the way, the 2000 series, were powered instead by an Intel 486. They were released in 1994 and had a bunch of new games with them, which sadly we didn't get to look at. Simon's 2000 series machines are in pieces in his garage, but here's some photos of them. Whoa, sexy. In any case, these 1000 series machines, which hit arcades in 1991, are just as awesome, if not more so because the machines themselves are much hencher. I mean, I expect this thing is bigger than most people's first car. Popping yourself down into one of these things really does feel like you're getting into a go-kart. This one actually does have a cover as standard that makes it look more like a race car. Apparently this was requested specifically as a modesty shield to stop young women having their skirts looked up, which is a very sad thing to have to protect against. And from men getting their balls kicked by their mates while they're playing. That is also a sad thing to protect against. What is wrong with humans? It can also be fitted with a steering wheel, but the joysticks are good enough. They feel firm and a bit stiff, but they are responsive enough. You do feel like you're in a throne of power. But for a full-on futuristic experience, you've got to go to the stand-up unit, the 1000CS. Look at the state of it, it looks amazing! A massive padded ring on a chunky platform, it already looks like something from a 70s sci-fi film. You've got to duck to get into it, and then the big ring really does slam down quite hard and then you feel enclosed, captured, ready to roll. To hook into virtuality on this one, you need to be strapped in round your waist with this belt thing, which is quite heavy, but it's not uncomfortable. Here's the official retailer video for it, and getting into it demonstrated by this attractive young blonde woman wearing a cat suit for whatever reason. Don't tell me I don't treat you lot well. I also go to arcades in my cat suit. Oi, didn't we ban you? Um, yes times. Someone with thighs that size has no business in a cat suit. Okay, one, that's body shaming, and two, I'll wear what I like. And three, please don't ban me again, I really need to play Chase HQ. Just get out. All right, fine, I'll take off the cat suit. Oh god, no, no, don't do that, no one wants to see that. Putting on the headset is an experience in itself. This thing is very heavy. The weight distribution is even across the whole unit, so it's not as bad as it sounds once it's on you though. When you put this thing on and pull down the lever at the back to strap your head in, there's something very definite and industrial about it. This is what plugging into the Matrix is really like. In fact, I'm not actually sure if I ever came out of the Matrix after playing this. I'm probably still plugged in and writing this review in a virtual world. Oh yeah, I must be playing make a YouTube channel to stave off the inevitable mental breakdown where I just go mad and adopt like 12 cats video game. That is 
One of my favourites. Got a lot of playtime on that one. With cables attached to the rest of the unit, you do feel tethered. The weight of it all means you are fully conscious of it. In the stand-up one, there's a gun with two triggers attached to the unit also. It's not heavy itself, but the cable is, so this thing feels a little dragged down. The sit-down machines use joysticks, so, so there's no problem there. I can't explain how weird it feels wearing this. The gubbins in the front is weighty, but otherwise it is quite comfortable unless you tilt your head up. Then the hard plastic of the goggles absolutely will dig into your cheeks. Hard. The view inside is shown through two circular lenses. Now, they are quite small really, and to be honest, I just felt like I was looking through binoculars. This makes the action look far away and doesn't help with the VR feel at all. Simon told us that there had actually originally been talks to print virtuality on the inside of the headband so that when you took it off, you would have virtuality stamped on your forehead. But they didn't do it in the end, because that is creepy. Here's some pics of the headset in bits too if you like that kind of tech porn. God, put some clothes on! Bare naked wires all up in this! I'll get a hit on YouTube for sensitive adult content. Again. First up, before I can do anything, I need to capture footage of these games. Now, footage of the games doesn't really exist online and it's pretty cool to experience it firsthand, so I was absolutely determined to capture the footage from the actual machines themselves. The owner of the machine, Simon, hadn't been able to capture footage for them yet, and me and Nostalgia Nerd thought, how hard could it be? Very, very hard. Simon's two sit-down machines are able to take SD cards thanks to a lot of tinkering on his side. The machines have a 9-pin output like most arcade machines. So we first try to composite out from the LCD panel which Simon has installed himself. The image that we got through my capture card was covered in horizontal lines. So then we tried to get the RGB signal from the back of the Amiga into SCART, but the SCART to HDMI converter didn't like it. So then we moved across to the other SD1000, which can output VGA through a custom board. Although this did work, and the picture did look nice, it also looked awful because it was incredibly flickery and no amount of wangling or crying would help. So then Peter suggested using something like a VCR to possibly convert the RGB signal into an RGB composite signal and then output that to the HDMI converter, the VCR acting as a kind of pass-through. This didn't work, but we also found an S-video cable. Oh god, I'm getting bored just writing this bit of the script. So we tried RGB to VCR SCART to S-video to HDMI converter, but that didn't work because the VCR only outputs its video channel to S-video. So we tried S-video to SCART on the original machine, which didn't work, so then we fiddled around with stuff and we tried composite again and it was dodgy, but stable-ish, and that was good enough at that stage. <laughs> So the result isn't anywhere near as I would like, but it's not hugely different to what it looks like in the headsets, to be honest. The sound is rubbish though, but honestly, after three hours of mucking around like a group of utter yogurts, I was ready to take whatever was given. Simon was telling us how he does actually own the majority of the games in physical copy, but unfortunately they have been afflicted with bit rot. Not an uncommon problem, but it does mean these games are getting more and more rare. Not unlike the machines themselves, actually. Simon also told us that he had contacted BT years ago since their office had a large number of virtuality machines, for whatever reason, offering to buy them. They informed him that they'd all been chucked in a skip. The amount of stories I've heard of incredible gubbins like this just being trashed makes my heart hurt. Now then, are we all cleared out upstairs? Ah, uh, just about. Hey, what do you want to do with all of this really rare and expensive stuff that isn't rare and expensive yet, but probably will be rare and expensive in the future? Just pop them in the skip, my love. All right then. Oh, actually, I'll have that one. I'm going to turn it into a lamp. Now, one of the great recurring things about these games was the voices. All the games had some form of voice introducing the game, and each one was just... I want to say cheesy, but that sounds bad, because they were awesome. There are earphones built into the headset, and the sound quality is really quite good. There's not a huge amount in the way of music in any of the games. Instead, you've got the game talking to you, and usually the hum of the engine of whatever you're driving. Along with sound effects, of course. As I mentioned in my R-Zone video, I am blind in my right eye and can't see 3D in general. I was told it is a good 3D effect, although the graphics are far from realistic, as you can see. 
Apparently the only thing that stops it being excellent is the narrow field of view. To me it does just look like a game on the TV close to my face. That being said, the 360 effect really is very good. The tracking on these headsets can easily rival that of a PlayStation VR. What you're seeing here is a, a tracking cube. So that generates a, a 3D magnetic field where you're stood. Right, okay. And inside the headset, just there, is a receiver. And that decides where you are in that field and right. which way you're looking. First up, let's look at the games made specifically for the stand-up unit. Some of the games only worked specifically on this unit, while others work on both this one and the first available virtuality machine, the 1000SU. Alright, now to get to the games, finally. Man, I really do need to cut down these scripts, don't I? Let's dance. First up, Dactyl Nightmare. This one was released in 1991 for the stand-up units. Dactyl Nightmare is a fantastic game where you and other players must try to kill each other using a VR equivalent of a Nerf gun, which reloads very slowly in a weird blocky world ruled over by a pterodactyl. Myself and Nostalgia Nerd played it against each other, and it's actually surprisingly fun even now. The single joystick you have moves you around and also is used for the trigger for the gun. Moving this controller around though didn't seem to affect where the gun would point. The aim is set to the centre of your current view. The pterodactyl will swoop and attack, and by that I mean it carries you into the sky and then drops you so that you smash into pieces. It's a bloody death in glorious 90s VR graphics. The sheer panic when you get picked up by one of these things is palpable. <laughs> Weirdly enough, when we tried to capture the footage directly from the machine, this happened. The game thought the headset was the wrong way round. Remember, this is meant for a stand-up machine, not this sit-down one that we had to use for capturing, but this is the only stand-up game that had this problem. When you've already shot your gun eight times, whether it hit the other player or not, you'll get attacked by the pterodactyl. You can shoot it when it attacks, but that's way harder than it looks. You do have unlimited lives though because it's a timed game, so just try to deck your opponent as many times as possible without getting yanked into the air by this git. That pterodactyl was originally born from a seagull made on the test software. It's not really enough of a bastard to be a seagull now though, is it? Uh. <laughs> After digging around in a load of old adverts, I think I found what was the original Ductile Nightmare, where two lads in speedos are shooting each other on a beach. So the sequel does make sense now, even if th the rest of the setting doesn't. The title screen on this one is probably the best part, and by that I don't mean the rest of the game is awful because it's not, it's great for the time and still fun now, but the title screen is so hilarious I crack up every time I see it. Look at this lad, he's absolutely terrified, yeah. as he might well be. The only time I've ever come close to looking that horrified is when I got my car insurance quote. VW Golf and registration number... <laughs> Grid Warriors. A rather lovely intro here of a dejected alien thing walking home after work. Dear lord, look at this lad. He's had a tough day. And here you are, a muscly robot dude. In this footage, this other lad appears to be a second player, which we hadn't hooked up. Wander around corridors looking for things to shoot. This one looks great in the headset. Oh look, a thing! Kill it! You're meant to find a big evil alien and you've got to stop a self-destruct mechanism and kill the alien or something like that. Check out this footage of Violet Berlin playing it on Bad Influence. So have you found the self-destruct mechanism? Uh, no. no I have found... Found, found the alien? Uh, no, I, look, I found my feet. Look, if I look down. That's marvellous, Violet. The universe <laughs> is safe in your hands. Oh, Violet. How we love you so. Oh, Violet. It's just a photo of her. I should probably rub off that lipstick mark, actually. I should probably stop putting lipstick on my vagina, to be fair. Gridbusters. Gridbusters was for the stand-up units 1000CS. It was also the last game made for the 1000CS. 
The premise is that you and a bunch of other people decked out in robot gear have to fight to the death in a coliseum. It works on one player or can be locally networked for up to four players playing in teams or in a deathmatch. This one looks great. You're a robot and you're out to deck other robots. You've got a rifle and you've got a jetpack. I'm seeing nothing wrong with that. Just needs more cats. The robots don't turn upside down or anything and they're on a solid plane of gravity. And that weird travel sickness that comes from a game as movement heavy as this is, is, is still there. It was funny to see how the CPUs were attacking each other, all piled into the middle of the playfield, shooting each other point blank, while we're just rocking about underneath with very little idea of what is going on. This is the kind of game that would work far better with multiple players because it doesn't look like the AI is especially clever on this one. <laughs> Look at them. Battlesphere is quite a talkative game, which does help with the immersion. Sat in a space fighter, your mission is to take down as many baddies as you can. It's on a full 360 degree turn at all angles, so it can be a bit disorientating. Amongst all this serious looking gubbins and the fact that you are essentially murdering aliens, it's a little jarring to see this cute little guy appear and wave at you. Well now I feel awful. This thing just wants to be my mate and I'm blasting it into space. Maybe in alien language, that friendly wave actually means fuck you. Flying Aces Flying Aces is a piloting game where you need to fly about and shoot down enemies as quickly as you can. You're accompanied by this lad in the back seat who witters at you the entire time and does your head in. It was weird how he made me jump despite the fact that he looks like a child's drawing on a balloon. The joysticks are meant to control the plane but it's really not as easy as it might look. The plane is a little delayed in receiving directions but it does work. You need to look around and see where the planes are coming from before getting yourself and your turret over there. If you get shot by the other planes, your bonnet will start showing these bullet holes. I thought they were butterflies at first. You need to be in the mindset of accepting these graphics to know what they are right away. This is one of the games that had a fair amount of push behind it, with cutouts being made to draw attention to it in the arcades. I wanted to get footage of a crash or something, but we absolutely could not wangle it to go smashing into the scenery, which was upsetting. To be honest, the setup of the joysticks is a bit of a struggle to a first timer on something like this. Game over, Meteor! XRX. Here's a sweet robot fighting game, and another one that had a fair bit of push behind it from the company. It was originally named Walker, but was initially released as Heavy Metal. It was changed over to XRX under direction of virtuality management, but the Heavy Metal logo does crop up in the game still. Exorex sees you, a convicted criminal, fighting for your life in a trial by combat mech game. Sat inside a war robot, you need to find and kill your opponents. The level of detail in this one is fantastic. Set against a barren rocky landscape, take a look down and see your robot dashboard and fly high up to take in the battleground. I mean, I appreciate what we're seeing here is many shades of brown and grey, but it does look pretty good, doesn't it? I mean, of course it can't be realistic, but it's believable at least. Look at the way these robots stalk along! So, so snacky! The animation on them is really lovely given we're playing with 20 frames per second here. The head tracking is great on this one, and sat inside that sit-down unit really does work very well with this game. The whole thing feels hench to play. I can't get over how sneaky these lads are. Look at them, so snacky. VTOL. If Flying Aces is for kids, then VTOL is the grown-up version. It's pretty much the same idea, flying around and trying to shoot other planes, but without the annoying tally ho moron in your ear. It also has less cartoony graphics, and it's a little more intuitive in the way it controls. Well, I say that, but the sit-down unit we had to play this one on has a half-broken joystick, which means every time Simon took off, he clipped the runway a little bit. And by little bit, I mean I'm pretty sure this plane is running for Ryanair. Here's a publicity vid for this one. Making out like using it is going to be like being in an actual jet fighter, enjoying these views in a, in a mask. Bit misleading, wouldn't you say? If by a bit, you mean very f***ing misleading. It's time to buck the trend of first person shooters with Total Destruction, a racing game that encourages you to smash the hell out of your opponents while you race. The scenery is a little sparse, we've just got a background, while the objects in the foreground consist of the track, other players, and occasionally stuff in the road. Like, 
loose tyres and this stack of cardboard boxes some idiot has just left here? Do they not know where the recycling is? Because it's not on a racetrack! This one would work much better with the steering wheel, but it's not too difficult to control because it's on a flat plane of movement, unlike the flying ones. When you smash into the other cars, there's not really as much carnage as you would hope for from a game called Total Destruction. Even though the sound of the collision is harsh, the actual hit just looks like a polite little bop. Sometimes you'll see half-hearted explosions randomly, but uh, yeah, I, I, I wanted more blood. Probably fun enough with pedals and steering wheel, but this one hasn't aged well. Hero. Virtuality had a few commissions from companies to make licensed games for advertising and stuff like that. Ones we know of are Bubble, which was for a bubblegum company, and this one, simply named Hero. Named after the deodorant and spray or whatever it is that it was meant to advertise. Well, this one isn't a game, it's meant to be an experience. A nice, calming ride through the skies. Oh god! Not sure if you can actually die on this one or anything, but basically you're flying a hand glider and you have somewhat limited movement to stop yourself smacking into other things, such as other people and seagulls. Are those seagulls defecating? Oh wow, well, this makes me really want to buy your body spray. Seagulls coughing everywhere, that's it, come on, spray it up. In the third scene, you're dangerously flying around some electricity pylons and getting electrocuted every time you touch one. Oh, 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 this guy's dead. Again, not really seeing the whole body spray angle here. And finally, it's time for a calming flight through a city. Without the benefit of having played this back when it actually came out, I can't tell if this is a cool experience or not. Now it's, it's kind of weak, nothing to do really apart from look around, but what you're looking at is just solid blocks of slightly grey colour, and the restrictive view of the goggles only makes it less immersive. And I had to look up what Hero is to work out what's supposed to be advertised here. There's no indication at all if you've never seen that logo before. But for a game game that's essentially an advert, although a bad one, it's not really that bad. You can't get mad at it really. You can just take off the headset and walk away. Or can you? Yeah, yeah you can. It's hard to find definitively just how many games were made for the virtuality machines before the rights to the machines were sold off in 1997. The machines were incredibly expensive and getting harder to find in arcades by then, but in those six years of running, really a good handful of games seems to have been made. But I can't find any information as to exactly how many. I'm guessing no less than 20 and uh, probably no more than 40. Whether this was due to the lack of third party support or the lack of demand for more, this has meant that copies of any of the games at all are very rare. It is sad to think that there might be some games out there which only exist on their disc, which has been eaten by Bitrot. Maybe there's some virtuality games out there that no one will ever get to play again. Legend Quest is another game specific to the 1000 series of machines that unfortunately we couldn't get working, which was heartbreaking as this one is the one I most wanted to see. Up to four people can play together battling through magical dungeons and you need to rescue some goddess lass. You can pick up different weapons and switch between the weapons. Looks like it's mostly the standard medieval style monster fare, with skeletons and spiders all out to get you. Look at this, it looks amazing! Here's Violet Berlin again, playing it on Bad Influence. No inappropriate joke this time, I admit the last one went a bit too far. On the plus side, that takes my number of restraining orders up to 10. Nice round number. Another game, the 1991 1000CS unit only game, Hero, not to be confused with the Hero Experience, sounded very interesting. It's a puzzle game allowing for four players and you're meant to work out puzzles in four different scenes. You're meant to spell out the word Hero with the letters you collect. I wish I could say I found out more about this one but I didn't find anything. Simon told me that his copy of it is indeed ruined by bit rot. This one is only five discs big, so it's one of the smaller ones. The second series of the machines, Intel 486 based rather than Amiga 3000 based, were introduced in 1994 and had games made specifically for it. Again, there was a sit down and a stand up version. Here they are. As you can see, they are a bit slimmer. Unfortunately, the Leicester Computer Museum doesn't have any of these, which is a shame because I reckon I'd have had a much better chance at nicking them and carrying them to my car. There were quite a few more games and experiences released with this second series, but information on them is pretty sparse. 
Dactyl Nightmare Race for the Eggs. It featured considerably updated graphics, and this time you and your opponents need to pick up dactyl eggs. Plus, the original Dactyl Nightmare got a graphical upgrade too, with Dactyl Nightmare SP. Ooh, looks like we've got a bloke in a cat suit now. That's one up for equality. This is a promo for the boxing game where you can see just how much better the graphics are, and I expect the motion tracking followed suit, although it was already pretty good in the first models. Look at this dude here, he's loving it! And another game, Ghost Train. Just looking at this one makes me feel travel sick. Zone Hunter. Looks like a better version of Grid Warriors. Here's a Pharaoh game showcased on some TV show. Uh, okay. Here's a diving game where apparently you're playing as a sex doll. My kind of game. One of the most important things about these games is that they allowed for multiple players. In fact, all of the games mentioned above are specifically designed to allow link up of up to four machines to play. That is, aside from the advert ones I talked about, to my knowledge. That would look sweet in an arcade. It's a shame that they were so prohibitively expensive. And even though, as we can see, the games were clearly getting better and the machines more sleek, that wouldn't be enough to save virtuality in the end. Well, even though the machines died a bit of a death, there's no doubt that they made a big impression on the people who played them. Both at the time and now. I don't have an Oculus Rift, so I pestered the only person who I know has one to let me play this modern recreation of Dactyl Nightmare. Once we actually got it running, that is. It's nice to know that technology continues to be a struggle throughout the generations. This is a very faithful recreation of the original Dactyl Nightmare, complete with the very slow reload of your arrow gun thing and absolutely brutal death animations. Don't look at his dead body. Well, look at it. Bearing in mind I don't see VR very well because of my eye, I did enjoy this because of how much it looks like the virtuality one. It was much clearer and closer to what I imagined the original game was meant to look like through the visor. Sadly, when you hit the ground, you don't see yourself explode into a million pieces. You just get to see space. This is a shame because the explosion was amazing. At least you get to see the other players blow to bits. Look at the state of this. Is someone going to... Shall I... Uh, Someone will clean that up. It was on this version that I was finally able to kill a dactyl. Look at this! Sensational! You know what would make death easier to accept in real life? If everything died in the same way that everything in Dactyl Nightmare does. <laughs> oh crap! Is someone dying in here? Uh, someone will clean that up. Innovation requires things to be a bit messy sometimes. Even at the time, these things weren't exactly what you could consider virtual reality, unless that reality looked, well, like this. But the tech behind it is amazing, the concept is great, every innovation is a stepping stone to greater things. And as far as stepping stones go, this one was pretty good. Lift the visette with both hands and place it on your head. If you do find yourself in Leicester, do check on the museum's Facebook page to see if they're planning to be open, because these things are really worth a look if you're a big fan of retro tech. Oh, and they're far too heavy to steal. I checked. And I should have full use of my arms back pretty soon after trying to drag one of those massive bad lads to my car without Simon noticing that I was nicking it. Oh. Hello? <laughs>